Welcome back 1200. In lieu of last week's lab, which was about an hour and a half long, let's see how quick we can knock week two out. So uh, with that, let's start at 4.4 in your lab manual, page 64. What we're gonna do is employ the thin lens equation to predict virtual image locations. Now, um, I, I talked about virtual and real images last week. We drew some gray diagrams. And if you can recall, um, this was done with a convex lens. And um, I didn't mention this at the first, um, I didn't mention this at first, but um, you may be wondering, well, what creates a virtual versus real image? And that all just simply depends on where you put the object in reference to that particular lens's focal length. So here is our lens. And what we are going to do is use the lens of nominal value 15. So um, actually we know what the value is, right? The value of that lens is, it's somewhere around here, 15.65. So I have a lens of focal length 15.65 and it's in this lens holder. Um, so 15 centimeters, let's say it's about right here. Uh, at these two positions. Now, if I was to put an object, say right here, so that light came from our left to right, I would get an image over here because this is farther away from the lens than its focal point. It's farther away than that 15.65 centimeters. So anywhere over here, way out to infinity, up until the focal uh, length, I will get a real image over here. Now, if I move this so that it is anywhere in between the lens and the focal length of that 15.65, anywhere in this region, I will not get a real image on this side. I will get a virtual image and it'll be in the front of the lens. Uh, real quick, last time our images were on this side. Uh, right now, I am um, demonstrating with images on this side, so don't let that confuse you. Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. I will put an image um, in between the lens and focal length. So uh, focal length was 15.65. I'll put it at 10 centimeters. This is our image. Don't confuse this with I'm sorry, this is our object. Don't confuse it with the image because last time we were using this screen uh, to produce an image. I'm going to use this as our object. I will place this at 190 centimeters on the track. This is located at 200 centimeters on the track. So our P value is 10 centimeters and um, this is the front of the lens because light is coming this way. But we know that our image is going to be on this side of the lens, on the front side of the lens, so our Q is going to be negative. And what I'm gonna do is look, at, look through the lens at this object and I indeed see an image. Now, I don't know where in space it is uh, located. That's what we're going to find out for this part of the lab, and this is how we do it. We are going to, excuse me for one second. We are going to use um, this here. And this will tell me where the image is. And what I will do is use parallax. So, real quick. If I have two objects, such as these two fingers, I'm going to put them at different distances. Now, as I move my head from right to left, these two images, um, where they were once overlapping each other, they shift in position, and that is the phenomenon of parallax. And um, let's see, the one that appears to move more is the one that's closer to me. The important thing to realize is that as I move them closer together, they shift in, the shift in position is less dramatic. When they are right next to each other, there is no shift in position. So using that concept, what I will do is look at the image through this lens and move my head back and forth. One eye will be looking through the lens, the other eye is gonna be looking at this object here, not through the lens, kind of like 
I'll, I'll be looking above the lens at this and I'm going to move my head back and forth. So the image that I see through the lens and this, it is going to shift relative to each other. And I'm going to adjust that so that when I move my head, I see no shift. And that's how I know where this image is located in space. So let me move you guys so that you can peer through this lens and we'll find that position. So let me put you on pause. So here is our object and here is our lens. Our object is that O on the screen and obviously our lens is right there in front of it. Let me make a few comments. Obviously, I know that you are viewing this sideways, but that doesn't matter. There's, there's intrinsically no up or down in this system. It's just an optics bench. In other words, we're not analyzing the motion of a pendulum or anything, right? So um, it, it's sideways just so that I could capture um, the phenomena that I'm going to be talking about more easily. And um, I mean, what I could have done was turn this whole system, this whole this whole track, I could have turned this 90 degrees so that we would be looking at it upright and, and the track would be at 90 degrees. Well, obviously, you'd know that um, that wasn't the case if I lied to you and said that because of the background. But uh, in any event, uh, that's why you're looking at it sideways and it's not going to concern us. See this object right here? I drew a line above it. And the reason I did that is so that I could illustrate uh, the concept of parallax. So you see how that line, let me focus on the rod, how that line is aligned with that rod in the background. If I move the camera to the right, or to the left, it's no longer aligned. You see how it is right on top of it or below it there, and then I move the camera to the left and it gets uh, misaligned. So I know that the rod and the image aren't at the so same location. So, so this lens here is producing an image that you're uh, looking at and it's somewhere in the background here somewhere in the region of that rod but not exactly where the rod is and we are going to determine where it is so let me put you on pause so after moving this rod back and forth while I'm viewing the image and rod <laughs> through separate through separate eyes <laughs> one eye looking at the image the other eye looking at this rod, I was able to find a position where I don't observe parallax. And I'll show you where that position is. Hold on. So we're back looking at the image. A lot of things look blurry right now, but that's just because the camera doesn't know exactly what to focus on. So, I mean, I could focus on the image. There you go, it's nice and crisp. Or I could focus on the rod. Uh, there's the rod. Now, now the uh, image becomes a bit blurry. Uh, but um, oh, let's just keep it on the image. So there's the image and the marker, the line I drew with the marker right above that image is indeed aligned with that rod that's in the background. So if I move the camera from left to right, or in your case, up and down, you see that that marker, that line from the marker stays right underneath the rod. And because it does so, uh, because we're not observing the uh, uh, phenomena of parallax, then that tells me that that rod is indeed located at the image location. And um, I did spend um, some time moving that rod back and forth, shifting around my eyes. And I mean, you could always go overboard and like fine tune it, uh, but it is, <laughs> I mean, how much better can I get than that? It seems to stay with it. Um, as I move the uh, camera up and down. So we just determined, um, we know how to find our Q value now, just determine the position of that rod. Now, uh, let me show you how we are going to determine the magnification of that image. So let me put you on pause. So in case you were wondering what that looked like, here is our rod. Uh, this is where our image is located. Now, just to um, reiterate, 
200 centimeters? Our lens is at 200 centimeters. Our object is at, is at 190, 190 centimeters. And the rod <clears throat> is at 172, 172 centimeters. So you could easily determine what our Q value is. Don't forget to make it negative because it is in front of the lens. What you're supposed to do, memory serves me, serves me right, is obviously pick a lens. We picked a lens with the nominal value of 15, but we're gonna use the measured value. We're also supposed to pick a P. We picked a P, 10 centimeters. Now, using the thin lens equation, you, you are supposed to calculate what Q should be. So that is gonna go in your lab manual. Then you're supposed to determine, you're supposed to determine Q from measuring it. That is just what we did right now. We measured Q. I don't know what Q is. Well, it's just 190 minus 172. That is our Q measured. And we need magnification. So we need to take some measurements. Um, our O, this O here, I measured um, from side to side. So if I could determine the magnification of the width, that's the same as determining the magnification of the height, right? I mean, it's a circular lens. Uh, the magnification is the magnification. It doesn't matter if it's the height or the width. So this width here, we, we are going to call H. And I measured that and it is um, 1.8 centimeters. 1.8 centimeters. Now I need to measure that width of the image. And we're going to call that our H prime. And this is how I'm going to do that. I just got this lens holder and clamped a, um, a ruler to it. And I'll put the ruler in here. So this ruler is right at the image. And I look through the lens. Okay. You don't need to see this. I don't even know. If it's hard enough in real life, let alone trying to do it with the, a little lens on the camera. But anyway, one of my eyes is looking at the image. The other eye is looking at the ruler in the background. So I see an image superimposed on my ruler. And I'm getting 20 point. Let me do a quick calculation. Four point seven centimeters. That is H prime, the height of the image. And again, I measured the width, but we're just calling that the height. So you have H and H prime. So now you can determine the magnification. In fact, you could determine the magnification uh, in two different ways, right? I would think your lab manual asks you to do that. I mean, why wouldn't it? But anyway, you can. There's two ways now to determine that magnification from those two uh, sets of measurements. Now, this was a, th this is challenging enough to do um, on your own with this equipment in front of you. Uh, it's even uh, more difficult. Hopefully, I made it easy. I should have just said it was easy, right? That was my um, intention to uh, make it look like I did this effortless, effortlessly. Uh, but anyway, there you go. We're done with this part and we'll move on to the next. Put you on pause. So we're now ready for 4.5 optics of a two lens instrument. And my goal is to make this as easy as possible for you. 
Before we start, you should read this here and uh, understand that fully, and I'll say a few words about that. As you can see, they're not gonna ask for too much information, uh, or we're not gonna collect that much data. It's just gonna be uh, one run and um, with a handful of uh, calculations. So go ahead and put me on pause and I'll turn the page, but uh, make sure you read that and understand it. So what we're looking at is page 67 in our lab manual, figure six. And that is indeed a diagram of the two lens system that we're going to examine. As you can see in the diagram, L1 produces an image called image one from this object. Now, L2 is going to produce an image in turn uh, somewhere over here. And the object for L2 is actually this image one. So image one is the object for L2 and it will produce an image two over here. From this diagram, I can also tell that this object is placed, well, it is P1 distance away from L1. And I know uh, from this uh, diagram here that P1 is greater than F1. In other words, this object isn't within the focal length of L1. If this object was within the focal length of L1, this image would be on the front of L1 and it would be a virtual image. The point I wanna make is that if I brought the object closer to L1, just so long as it doesn't reach its focal point and go beyond it, but just closer to L1, approaching L1's focal length, that would produce an image farther away to our right. And if this image was indeed farther to our right so that it is on the right side of L2, our object for L2 would be a virtual object. <clears throat> and I mentioned this because uh, I touched upon it briefly last week when we did those ray diagram diagrams with convex lenses. And according to the author of the lab manual, well, he's giving us the option of creating an object for L2 that is either real or virtual. So that's how we would uh, obtain a virtual object for lens two if we were to move this closer and in effect move the image to the back side of lens two. Now I'm really tempted to do that because that's the more interesting case, but okay, let's go ahead and make this uh, easier. We will make an object for L2 that is real. So it'll be in the front of lens two. And well, basically just recreate this here. The last thing that I wanna mention is that when we go ahead and do create the two lens system as illustrated in that uh, diagram, the object, well, this is going to be uh, switched. The object will be here, light will be coming from this direction, from my right to my left. This will be lens one, this will be lens two. It's just configured in the opposite direction. And the reason being is that, well, our optic bench is set up so that light travels from right to left as opposed to this diagram. And um, that just has to do with our uh, our mounts, our optic mounts for the, um, the lenses screen and object. It would take me too much time to reconfigure it for the light to go in the opposite direction. So just bear that in mind and let's go ahead and take the measurements for this. So here we go. Two lens holders. Uh, we have a screen over there to determine where the image is projected and our object. Now, as always, oh, again, I will be giving you locations, locate lens locations, screen locations, and from that you determine the P's and Q's. Our object as always is, is located at 190.00 centimeters and we are supposed to pick, pick a P. Now <clears throat> I am placing this at, let's see, we'll put it at 165. 
uh, 165.00 uh, centimeters. So our P1, well, it's just 25.00 centimeters, right? 25 centimeters. That is our P1. And what else are we supposed to do? <coughs> A D. The D they want is the distance between the two lenses. So this one here, I shall place at 110.00. This is located on 110.00. Okay, so obviously D is what, 55 centimeters. I said I was gonna make you figure this out, but anyway. Um, oh, our focal lengths. So I picked for F1 the nominal value of positive 15, positive because it's a convex lens. Well, both of them are convex lenses, so they both have positive focal length. This one though, we're not just gonna put in that nominal value, we already experimentally uh, measured it. And uh, we got 15.65 centimeters for this focal length. F2 is the nominal um, uh, 10 centimeter lens, which came out to be 9.70 centimeters. Um, so we have our two focal lengths, we have our P and we have our D, our P1, because there's gonna be two Ps after all, right? Now what they want us to do is calculate Q1. So when I turn this bulb on, it is going to produce an image somewhere over here. So calculate what this Q should be. I would just put me on pause right now and figure it out what that is. And of course, we use the thin lens equation. 1 over F is equal to 1 over P plus 1 over Q. You know what the F is? Focal length. You know what the P is? So determine that Q. <clears throat> So you figured out what that Q is, now we're going to measure the Q. I should call it, forgive me, Q1, because again, there's two different Qs. Um, so let me uh, commit to those subscripts. What is Q1 measured? What I'll do is simply move this screen until I get a focused image on that screen obviously that is where uh, image one is located and then I could determine Q1. So uh, where is that screen? One twenty five point nine centimeters. Let me put you in pause so you can just take a look at it. That is our image. If you wanna make a mental note, it is indeed inverted, but nevertheless, there it is. Let me put you back. Okay, so you are back at your seat and we are going to take the rest of the measurements now. We're almost halfway done. They want you to determine what P2 is now. So P1, Q1. P2, Q2. So what is P2? Now, well, they tell you just go ahead and calculate it by what? D minus Q1. So the question becomes, which Q1 do we use, the calculated or measured? I would just use the measured one. Lens two, sees this object, or it's gonna see it after I remove this. So lens two sees this object right here, and you've just, if you haven't put me on pause, but you've just determined what P2 is. So they want you to now calculate what Q2 is. And again, we just do that the same exact way we did for the first lens. One over F2 is equal to one over P2 plus one over Q2. Now we know what the focal length F2 is of this lens. We figured out what P2 is. 
this will determine what Q2 is. So put me on pause and figure that out. Okay, now let us measure what Q2 is. There's an image form somewhere over here. How do we find out where that is? Easy, right? Well, same thing. Move this back and forth until we get, um, until we get an image. Eighty-five point five centimeters. That is where that screen is located. Eighty-five point five centimeters. Now, let's see what else do they want us to do. Of course, take the difference between this location and that location to determine your measured Q two. And last thing to do is address the question. Is the final image real or virtual? Let me just say that um, the object, oh, I'm sorry, the image here from this two lens system is magnified so much that the whole bulb isn't displayed on the screen. This lens is too small to capture that whole big image. So, if I was to show you that image, it, it wouldn't be clear whether or not it was upright or inverted with respect to how the uh, uh, initial object looks. So here's how we can determine it mathematically. This lens here produced image one. What is the magnification of image one? Easy. We know the P1, we know the Q1, so we can easily determine, well, I'll call it M1. And that is nothing more than negative Q over P. P is positive, Q is positive. So the magnification of this image here, M1, is negative. The negative means the, the image is inverted. So put that M1 aside now. We just know it's negative. Let's consider the image produced uh, from lens two. So there was some object here, which was the image from lens one. There's an object here, and we know the P2 and we know the Q2. What is the magnification of this object from this lens? Positive P2, positive Q2. So the magnification M2 of that lens is negative P2. Uh, negative Q2 over uh, P2 and since these two are positive that magnification is negative if you ever want to determine when you have a multiple lens system of the magnification of the final image compared to the height of the original object what you do is just take the product of the individual magnifications of each lenses in other words final magnification of this object is m1 times m2 and they were both negative right so m1 times m2 is going to yield product that is positive and a positive magnification means that our image is indeed upright so there you go, you just addressed. In your lab manual, they call it G. Question G. That's it, let's build a telescope. We're now ready to do our experiment on telescopes. So in back of me, I have two lenses and they indeed are, are situated in such a way that it constitutes a simple telescope. I have a distant object over there and we're gonna take a look at it through this telescope. And I just want to say that um, when we're studying lenses and mirrors, obviously we didn't do any experiments on mirrors, but um, I assume in your lecture portion of the class you are talking about uh, mirrors. There is um, a, a tremendous amount of, of material to learn. And telescopes is just a tiny, tiny, almost footnote on that material. So we don't need to go into detail, all the subtleties and the uh, uh, ray diagrams used to illustrate how this works. It is just enough to know that 
this objective lens is chosen so that its focal length is rather large. And our eyepiece lens is chosen so that the focal length is uh, very small. Now, a distant object <clears throat> is going to produce incoming light rays that can be approximated as uh, parallel to each other. So when they are incident on this side of this objective lens, they all uh, they form an image at the focal length of this lens. Now, that image there is put at the focal length of this lens, and this lens acts as a magnifying glass. So what we are doing is magnifying angles. We aren't, we aren't magnifying um, images like we did in the first part of the lab where we actually measured the height of the object and then compared that to the height of the image. So the image height was actually really larger than the height of the object. For instance, when you're looking at the moon, you don't see an image that is really larger than the actual diameter of the moon, right? But the image looks larger, and that's due to angular magnification. So if I have a distant object and um, it is subtended at this location um, with some lines such that, let's say this line is at the top of the, it points towards the top of the object, and this line points at the bottom of the object, there is an angle here. So for this angle, theta, it is going to be incredibly tiny if that's a distant object. These, these lines are almost parallel. They, are, they come to a point here at a very tiny angle. So what the telescope is going to do is when you uh, view the image through the eyepiece, it is going to make that tiny angle larger. So magnification for telescopes is an angular magnification. But anyway, let's just uh, do what the lab instructs us to do. It is, uh, it's just some basic measurements and we'll knock that out quickly. So let me put you on pause. So here's another view of our simple telescope. I have an eyepiece lens and an objective lens. And we, what we would do is look in this direction through this lens at our distant object over there. And to make it distant, um, hopefully it's far enough, I put it, I situated this optic bench so that it is, it is diagonally across the length of uh, our garage here. And what you could see, well, I don't know if you can see it, but um, right at the tip of this pencil, there is a little uh, Sharpie, a little marker hanging from that bike. Let me see if I could, I'll zoom in on it. So, so there it is. Uh, there is our distant object that we'll be looking through. So what I'll do is I'll put the camera at the eyepiece and see what this little Sharpie looks like. Hold on just a second. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, first off, this is extremely difficult to do to find that image with a cell phone. Instead of looking at it through my eye, I placed the camera in front of that uh, two lens system, our telescope, and I was able to find the right uh, uh, distance to uh, uh, focus in on that image. There you go, there is our Sharpie where you are looking through the telescope. And uh, sorry if it's moving around, it's not mounted, that wasn't possible, but anyway, there you go. So let me show you what that pen looks like with the unaided eye. I will simply move the camera and let me focus, see if I could focus in on the pen. So there you go. I just focused on the pen. That is how small it is without uh, looking through the telescope. I'm looking at page 67, 4.5.1, construct a telescope. Let me help you out with this data part. Um, equation seven, first of all, you know, I, they wrote it wrong. So if you're looking at, at equation seven, the left-hand side of that equation says tangent of A objective divided by tangent of A eyepiece is equal to focal length of the objective lens divided by the focal length of the eyepiece lens. Now, the left-hand side of the uh, equation, it's, it should be inverted. But uh, I just bring that to your attention if you were really studying this in 
that could be confusing because it doesn't match the geometry. But bottom line is the angular magnification is indeed F objective over F eyepiece. Equation A is correct. Actually, we don't even need that in this analysis. But anyway, moving along to the next page, we have, they want you to record the focal length of the objective lens. And that should be the largest focal length possible. Our largest one was a nominal 20. Don't just put 20 centimeters, of course, right? We measured it, we experimentally determined what it was. I want to say it was 22.00. That would be your F objective. Your F eyepiece should be as short as possible. Therefore, we used our nominal five centimeter convex lens. And um, that was like, I think 4.65, something like that. But anyway, uh, that would be your focal length of the eyepiece. Uh, verify uh, what that was when we measured it. Now they want the D, the distance between these two lenses. Now, I will give you the location of these lenses. This eyepiece lens is located at 200.00 centimeters. This um, objective lens is located at 170. I can't see it. It's too dark in here. Um, let me get a flashlight. Actually, I'll put you on pause. Okay, sorry about that. This is located at 172.7 centimeters. So from those two locations, you can determine your D. Now, the question is, what is the magnification? Can you estimate this? Now, uh, because of that question, I don't think that they're asking you to estimate the angular magnification. I mean, that would be way too difficult. These are extremely, extremely small angles. Um, plus, angle, angular magnification is defined and you can easily find it by taking the ratio of those two focal lengths. Um, what they want you to do is the apparent magnification. In other words, for our previous experiments when we were determining the magnification, we compared the image height to the actual height of the object. So we got a magnification uh, that was larger than one. Now for this, for telescopes, the object is a certain height and our image isn't gonna be larger than that, right? When we look at the moon, we're not looking at an image that is actually larger than the actual moon size but there is indeed an apparent magnification and that's what uh, they want you to uh, estimate. So this is how you go about doing it. You want to compare the height of the object you're looking at when you're looking at it through the telescope with the apparent height of the object when you're not looking at it through the <laughs> telescope. So to easily estimate this, just simply uh, rewind go back in the video where I had the camera in front of the telescope lens eyepiece and you saw that uh, magnified image just get a ruler remember this is just an estimate just get a ruler place it over that image and uh, uh, measure it then when I move the camera away from the eyepiece and then focus in on that distant object put the ruler measure what it is then and uh, take the ratio so that will be a good approximation of the magnification and for telescopes, we're done. Okay, we are now at the point where we are to construct a two lens microscope. What you're looking at right now is page 67 in your lab manual, figure six. We've already seen this uh, diagram, but the author refers us back to it for the microscope because it is uh, the same design. The only difference is that for the two lens microscope, there are, like, are a couple of requirements. Now, when we did the optics of two lens instruments using this diagram, there was no condition on the focal lengths of L1 or L2. We could arbitrarily uh, choose those focus, focus points. Uh, of course, they were both supposed to be positive, which they were, and they'll both be positive in this case as well. But for L1, we need to choose a lens with a small focal length, where L2 is gonna have a focal length of um, not only larger than L1, but like as large as possible. It's kind of like the telescope, but in reverse order. So this lens two right here is going to be our eyepiece. It's going to have a large focal length. We'll be looking in this direction. And L1 will be 
our objective um, objective lens and it is going to have a small focal uh, focal length now before uh, when we use this diagram uh, we could configure it pretty much any way we wanted to uh, in other words image one could fall anywhere in this region and what happened was with the focal length of L2, I labeled it here for the uh, two lens micro microscope, but in the previous experiment, it was over here. And of course, if image one, which is object two for lens two, um, if it is to the left of the focal length like it was, it would have produced a real image over here, which indeed it did. For the two lens microscope, we necessarily need image one to be to the right of focal length two. So that's why I drew it in here. It's to the right of it. In other words, it's within the focal length of lens two. So this image one, which becomes the object, which I sometimes call object two, for lens two, it will produce an image that is virtual and will be on the left side of L2 somewhere over here. So we put our object very close to the focal length of lens one and we look through the eyepiece and observe the final image that will be in this area here and we'll go ahead and construct this and see if it is indeed magnified. So hold on and we'll set that up. So here's our two lens microscope. We are going to use the same lenses that we used for the telescope. This is the nominal five, that is the nominal uh, 20. When we used the telescope, we were looking at it uh, through this, in this direction. So this was the uh, eyepiece lens. For the telescope, we're going to be looking uh, through the opposite direction. So this becomes our eyepiece lens and this becomes our objective lens. And this here is the object under investigation. So I'm looking at page uh, 68 in the lab manual. And uh, let's see, choose the lenses we just did. Uh, the distance D between them and P. So I'll let you figure out what those are. I will just uh, report to you the positions um, of these objects. The, let's see, this lens here, the eyepiece, it is at 148.00. The objective lens is at 181.7 centimeters and the object is at 190.00 uh, centimeters. Now, I want this distance pretty much um, as, as small as possible, as long as this object isn't short, as long as this distance isn't shorter than the focal length of that lens. So, it looks like I could even bring it in closer, but um, actually I can't. This is our stand-in object. We're just going to use this light bulb, you'll see why in a minute, uh, to construct the, uh, teles uh, the microscope. But when we actually look through it, I'm going to take this light bulb away and replace it with this. I drew a little line here and this will be the object um, that we're investigating. I mean, it should be obvious. Do I really want to look through a microscope at a light bulb? So there you go. We have our two lenses, our D and our P, or you're able to figure out what our uh, P and our D is. So what you need to do now is, according to the lab manual, calculate Q1. One over F1 is equal to one over P1 plus one over Q1. So solve that because you know F1 and you know P1. So you need to calculate where the image is gonna lie. So you could probably put me on pause and figure that out. And what we'll do next is measure where that image is. So we'll do that now. I'll assume we already calculated Q1. Turn on the bulb. <clears throat> I'm just using this as a screen now. I will move this back and forth until I get a nice image. And there you go. Um, let me put you on pause and show you that. 
So here's our two lens microscope. We are going to use the same lenses that we used for the telescope. This is the nominal five, that is the nominal uh, 20. When we used the telescope, we were looking at it uh, through this, in this direction. So this was the uh, eyepiece lens. For the telescope, we're gonna be looking uh, through the opposite direction. So this becomes our eyepiece lens and this becomes our objective lens. And this here is the object under investigation. So I'm looking at page uh, 68 in the lab manual. And uh, let's see, choose the lenses we just did. Uh, the distance D between them and P. So I'll let you figure out what those are. I will just uh, report to you the positions um, of these objects. The, let's see, this lens here, the eyepiece, it is at 148.00. The objective lens is at 181.7 centimeters and the object is at 190.00 uh, centimeters. Now, I want this distance pretty much um, as, as, as small as possible, as long as this object isn't short, as long as this distance isn't shorter than the focal length of that lens. So. It looks like I could even bring it in closer, but um, actually I can't. This is our stand-in object. We're just going to use this light bulb, you'll see why in a minute, uh, to construct the, uh, teles uh, the microscope. But when we actually look through it, I'm going to take this light bulb away and replace it with this. I drew a little line here and this will be the object um, that we're investigating. Uh, I mean, it should be obvious. Do I really want to look through a microscope at a bright bulb? <laughs> so there you go. We have our two lenses, our D and our P, or you're able to figure out what our uh, P and our D is. So what you need to do now is, according to the lab manual, calculate Q1. 1 over F1 is equal to 1 over P1 plus 1 over Q1. So solve that because you know F1 and you know P1. So you need to calculate where the image is going to lie. So you could probably put me on pause and figure that out. And what we'll do next is measure where that image is. So we'll do that now. I'll assume you already calculated Q1. Turn on the bulb. <clears throat> I'm just using this as a screen now. I will move this back and forth until I get a nice image. And there you go. Um, let me put you on pause and show you that. So there's our image. And um, it's not coming in as nice as it is with the naked eye, but there you go. So let me uh, set you back down and I'll give you the position, the measured position of that image. So this image that we found is located at 165.6 centimeters. Now, bear in mind, when we measured the focal lengths of these lenses. We did it three different times uh, with the three different methods and uh, we came up with three different values. Also, when I'm finding the um, spot that seems to have the best or the most crisp image, there is quite a lot of error associated with that. So things aren't gonna be perfect. Um, with that said, let us determine where Q2 is going to be. Now, I just gave you the position of this image from this lens. The image now becomes the object for this lens. So this distance here is our P2. We know the focal length of lens two. So one over F2 is equal to one over P2 plus one over Q2. You need to find Q2. So you should probably do that now.
Okay, so you found it. And I'm hoping that your calculation was negative because what we want what we wanted to do is put this image within the focal length of that lens and if it is within the focal length of that lens uh, the image is not going to be a real image over here it's going to be a virtual image over here and for an image on this side of the lens on the front side of the lens that q should be negative so um, we are now going to take a look at it and the way we're going to take a look at it is we're simply going to view the uh, take a look through this eyepiece lens and observe that image in this area and what I'm going to do is get rid of this because <clears throat> we don't want to stare right in the center of some bright bulb magnified bright bulb. I'm going to put this here. This has a little line that I think is approximately uh, two, two centimeters. You see that little tiny line? Two centimeters in width. butted up against here. This image is indeed at 190.00, so I didn't mess with any any P's. If I messed with the P, I would have messed with the Q, then I would have messed with that P. So yeah, th this is right at 190.00. Uh, and let's take a look uh, through that eyepiece. By the way, your lab manual wants, to, wants you to estimate the magnification and this is how we're going to do it. I will put you up there and you will look through the eyepiece. And when you see the image, you can just press pause, get a ruler and measure the image you see. Then what I'll do is take this image out of this holder and put the image at about the same location get rid of the lens or just move the camera so that you're not looking through the lens anymore you're at looking at the actual image um, at the same at the same distance press pause measure that and there you go you have your uh, uh, two h's h's and h prime take the ratio and get the magnification so i'll put you on pause and put you up there Okay, so you are now looking through the eyepiece of our microscope. So I want to mention that no matter what I do, I can't get the camera to focus on that line. When I look through the eyepiece of this microscope with my naked eye, the line you see there in the center of that lens is uh, nice and crisp, well-defined, sharp uh, lines. It's magnified. I can see all the detail of the line. But uh, for whatever reason, um, the camera won't focus on it. I, I think it's, it's confusing that ima the image you see with the outer edge of the ring holder. So the ring holder is preventing it from focusing on the image. But anyway, uh, that won't um, uh, stop you or hurt you from measuring its height. So go ahead, uh, put me on pause and measure that height. Okay, now you are going to measure the height of the... Uh, image without magnifying it and um, I, I, I figured out a different way to do it all I'm going to do is remove the lenses so I remove the first lens I remove the second lens and where is it I don't see it there it is so there's the actual line that you are looking at on the screen so um, go ahead and pause the video and measure that line. So that will be your H and the magnified image will be your H prime. So your magnification of this telescope is H prime over H. Let me put you on pause and uh, wrap things up for this part of the lab. 
So I just wanted to say a quick word about where that virtual image is located. When we were looking at the diagram and as I was explaining things, I was assuming the virtual image would be somewhere around here. I did some quick calculations and it turns out that the virtual image is actually somewhere around here. It's not even between those lenses. Uh, calculate the position of your virtual image. It, it is where it is. Uh, it's okay that it's back here. It'd be interesting to test um, its location to see not only um, if it is indeed in this area, well, I'm sure it is because our calculations are telling us it is, it is. but um, I would like to uh, verify exactly where it is. And we'd have to do that with the uh, parallax uh, uh, method, but of course, there's no way in hell we're gonna do that. Well, I'm not gonna do that. So we are finished with the two lens microscope and all we need to do now is the human eye and then we're done. So let me put you on pause. Okay, the last part of this lab involves the human eye or a model of the human eye. And um, let me just say, the way I've been filming this uh, lab is uh, to provide you with a lot of information, uh, basically helping you do the lab. And um, I did not want to make this part two video as long as the part one. I think it's approaching that length though. So um, for this part, I am just going to leave this in your hands. So read up on this so that you understand uh, what you're supposed to be doing. And um, I'll kind of just really try not to say anything. I'm going to put the camera right above this human eye model so you can see uh, what the author is talking about when he, when he refers to different components in the uh, lab manual. So for the most part, we just have this, the eye, and that, our image. It is a different image uh, than what we've been using previously. Instead of that big bulb, we are going to have a pattern. And that pattern is, here's the light. You can't see it from here, but it's somewhat of like a bullseye pattern, something like that in the center. So we'll get that image in the retina of this eye. Let me put you on pause so you can take a peek inside that eyeball. First of all, here is the, the front part of the eye. This here is the retina. And this here is um, a little holder for lenses to be placed in there because uh, during this experiment, we are gonna put like corrective lenses on that eyeball, like it's wearing glasses. So uh, that's the front of it. Now inside, this is embarrassing, um, that is quite dirty. Let me put a flashlight in there. Um, I don't know what's going on with that, but it's probably what the inside of everyone's coffee maker looks like. So this here is the retina. That is the screen. And on the bottom, you can see a ruler there. Um, the screen is placed at the 16 centimeter mark. The author keeps saying like things like, oh, it, doesn't, it may not appear to look like it's 16 centimeters, but it is. And uh, what he means by that is um, if you look over here, you, you don't see um, a zero. And that's just because the origin is shifted uh, to be somewhere in this region where the uh, cornea is located. So that screen is 16 centimeters from the cornea. And that's all you need to know as far as what's the, what the inside of this eye looks like. Now, um, this screen that I talked about, it is gonna stay at that position for the entirety of this experiment. It doesn't have to be move, moved. It's always 16 centimeters uh, from the cornea. And I will put you on pause and we'll start the experiment. Part one, move that object around until or try and form an image on this retina. So I'm not gonna go through the process. I already tried it. I could not form an image on that retina. And it's a loaded question. We're not supposed to. We're just, this is to convince ourselves that um, the human eye wouldn't work without the fluid inside of it uh, based on the curvature of that retina uh, there. So I couldn't form an image and you'll just take my word for it. So we're filling this up with water 
and um, and then we'll get started. In fact, what I'll do is um, let me put you on pause and kind of move this around so that I can't find an image and then show you. Okay, guys, let me tell you, first of all, I'm quite disappointed. Uh, this lab uh, doesn't translate well at all uh, to, um, uh, to video, but uh, it, you'll see what I'm talking about momentarily. I am showing you the object that is uh, the pattern that should be produced on the retina of the eye, the object. So let me turn the camera around. Um, there is our eye. Now, what I'm going to do is focus on the screen. And that uh, pattern produced uh, on the object is, uh, is formed on that retina. <laughs> and you can't see it. It looks horrible. I can see it with the naked eye on that retina. Although not very uh, well defined and clear, I could definitely see it, but you can't. If I move the object uh, farther away, um, it disappears. If I move it closer, right there it's in focus, you can't see it, but if I move it closer, it disappears. So at a specific location, uh, the object is indeed, um, there is an image on that retina of the object, so you'll just have to take my word for it. Let me put you on pause and um, say a, a, a few words. So we are now doing uh, part two. Uh, I moved this back and forth. I focused it on the retina. That's what you were looking at when I had the camera above the eye here. And um, I'm not going to tell you the position of this and the position of that. I'll just tell you what P is. Uh, by the way, the author explains how the cornea is set back from the edge of this, um, from this case here. 0.2 centimeters, so he reminds you to like uh, take that into account when you determine the distance from cornea to object. Don't worry about that. I've taken care of that uh, for you. Bottom line is P, the distance between object and cornea, is 14.55 centimeters. Now, after I moved this about so that I got an image on the retina, what I then did, uh, which you didn't see, was... <clears throat> I moved this slowly uh, to my left until I visibly saw the image get out of focus, recorded that value, then uh, refocused it, then moved it closer to the retina to my right until that image uh, was uh, visibly uh, out of focus or began to uh, get out of focus and recorded that value. So the sum of those two values is, it turns out to be 3.0 centimeters. And um, I mean, that's quite some distance, but nevertheless, that is uh, what it is. That is our error in our measurement. So um, we just finished part two. Now we're gonna put some glasses on this guy, some corrective lenses. <laughs> okay, so let me put you on pause. Okay, so this is part three. <sighs> let me back up for one second. <clears throat> When we did part two, I gave you this p-value, but I'm gonna throw out some more data, keep a record of it just in case you need it. The cornea was located at 150.00 centimeters, the cornea. This object, I moved it, but in part two, when we found uh, the position where it was focused on the retina, the position of the object was 135.00. 45. And then, of course, if you subtract those two numbers, you'll get this p-value, which I already gave you, 14.55. Well, on to the next part. What I did was I inserted a convex lens uh, in that uh, right, right in front of the eye, the cornea. And uh, it was with the nominal value of uh, plus 20, plus 20 focal length. So when I inserted it, the image was no longer in focus. I had to uh, move this a bit to bring it in focus. Actually, I had to bring it in a little bit closer. And uh, now it's focused on the screen. Good news is, is that it's easier to focus. It looks a lot better. Actually, let me give you a little peek of it. So hold on. So 
behind this lens is the cornea. Here's the uh, nominal 20 lens I put in front of it. And in the back there, you can see uh, the image. And it looks a lot better uh, with the naked eye, but at least you could get <laughs> some idea of an image with the camera. So there it is. Let me put you on pause. So let me give you some more data. This object, after moving it and bringing it into focus, is now a different position. It is located at 140.85 centimeters. Now, I didn't move the eye, but what you need to know is where the lens is. And that lens is located at 149.70 centimeters. In other words, it's just... <laughs> three centimeters over to the left of that cornea. It's right in front of it. Um, now, I'm, I'm going to say a few things just to help you with your analysis. I read ahead, and what they're going to want you to do is find the location of the virtual image produced by this object. By the way, if that is indeed, well, it is a nominal 20 centimeter lens, so uh, 20 centimeters from this lens is somewhere around here. So if this object is within the focal length of this lens, what happens? Our image is virtual. So the image isn't projected behind the lens. This virtual image is going to be um, somewhere over here. Actually, it's not necessarily behind this. All I could positively say at this point is that it will be somewhere in front of the lens, somewhere over here. So how do we get an image on this retina if that 20 centimeter lens produced a virtual image here? The cornea of the eye combined with the fluid in the water. Um, it sees this virtual image. <laughs> in other words, the virtual image produced by that lens acts as the object for the cornea slash water. That's why we get an image in the back. And in the analysis, they want you to determine where that virtual image is located. So I gave you the position of the lens, which is um, 149.7 centimeters. I gave you the position of the object, um, 140.85 centimeters, you subtract that and, and get your new uh, P. Use the uh, thin lens formula to determine where the Q is and you should get a negative number if you're doing the uh, calculations correctly. And if you get a ne negative Q, that just means that the image is in the front of the lens, so it's going to be somewhere around here. Now they want you to compare that position with something else. I won't tell you what it is, but it'll be in the analysis. So that's it for this part. Let's do it one more time, but with a different type of lens. This was a, a, a positive 20 focal length, a convex lens. Now we're gonna throw in a concave lens, which has a negative focal length, and we'll use a negative uh, 50 value. <sighs> Actually, they're gonna want you to determine the Ver the location of the virtual image for that lens as well. We did not, this is the first time we're using that lens with the negative 50 value. So we're just gonna have to assume it's negative 50. So there may be more error involved in your analysis when it comes to figuring out the virtual image location with the negative 50 lens, because we didn't actually uh, experimentally measure it. So let's see how close to 50 it is from the manufacturer, no, negative 50. But let me put you on pause. Okay, on to part four. Now, for years, um, this hasn't even been done because uh, we didn't have in our lab uh, concave lenses of focal length negative 50. Lucky for you, I bought some. <laughs> They don't fit in that lens holder, so I just taped it to the front of our eyeball here. Uh, but important thing is, is that concave lens 
is located at the same position that the other lens, that convex lens, was. And that was 149.7 centimeters. So 149.7 centimeters, and I had to adjust this uh, so that I could uh, refocus the image. Uh, in other words, slipping that lens in uh, creates the image to be uh, blurry and out of focus. So I moved this around and I have a new location. The new location of our object is 128.65 centimeters. I'm not going to put you on pause and put you up there because uh, the image on the retina is like really tiny. In fact, as the lab manual mentions, it's it, there's going to be more error in this calculation because it was difficult to focus, find that uh, 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 sharp image. But anyway, you wouldn't be able to see it with the camera. It is uh, in focus the best I can get it uh, at that position. So you have this look, you have the location of the lens, you have the location of the object, again, 128.65. So um, you can determine the P distance between lens and object, forget the cornea, again, this is in your analysis part, you can determine the P between your uh, lens and object so that you could determine the Q, the position of that virtual image. So um, there's going to be some virtual image here that the cornea sees, and that's how it produces the image on the retina. Now it's interesting, the point of this is that you should find that these virtual images produced in the last two cases, they should fall where our object was originally without any corrective lenses on the eye. So that is your analysis. Um, they do ask for some propagation of error. That's kind of tricky. You might want to um, get the assistance of your instructor if, if, if it's not clear on, uh, on how to do that. But um, we are finished. We're done. And, um, you know, this was a good three hours taking into account part one and two. Just want to say if it takes you three hours to view this, it takes me 10 times that long to. Uh, uh, to film it and edit it, to put it all together. Uh, but it was a pleasure doing this for you. And as always, I feel like there should be some kind of celebration. But anyway, I will see you next week.